Um, so we're going to go through equatorially trapped waves, basically, just some, some theory. So we were talking about kind of the, the steady state kind of mean circulation. Now we're going to focus on just the wave dynamics of, of the atmosphere and how it adjusts to given perturbations. Most of the talk, so these kind of uh, first kind of three dot points, is all going to focus on just um, free wave solutions, so not um, with no forcing, not really, under, not really concerning ourselves with what's going to force these waves, just looking at the potential wave solutions um, of, of the atmosphere, and, and in this case, it's of the ocean as well. Okay, but before we get to that, I'm, I'm not sure how much kind of... Um, how much kind of theory you've kind of gone through in this. So we're going to start, the starting point for me is going to be um, a linear shallow water model. Um, so we've just kind of got, you know, these three equations and three unknowns. So the first equation is um, zonal velocity, second equation is meridional velocity, and the third equation is conservation of mass, uh, basically. And so what, what we're doing is we're modelling um, for a shallow water model, uh, I, sh I should start by saying it can be shown that when you're linearize, linearizing around a basic state and you're assuming that the motions um, of the atmosphere are relatively small in regards to the mean, you can separate um, all of the variability into a discrete number of modes, okay? So you can kind of set, uh, sorry, it's an infinite number of these kind of modes which are represented by the shallow water equations. So you can kind of say, you know, there, there might be so an infinite number of these equations, and you can then add them all together and kind of come up with the real solution, which will be the total solution from a linear model. But in most cases, you really only need to consider the first couple of modes. So it kind of comes down to this kind of a, a much more of a simplification of the system, and it allows you to do some of these kind of analytical solutions, which you wouldn't normally be able to do. Okay, so we've kind of got, you know, the pressure gradient terms here. Um, so I should... I apologise a little bit. So these are uh, the shallow water model equations for the ocean, hence the G prime as opposed to... A so this is like the, a reduced gravity. But once we non-dimensionalise, it's all exactly the same anyway. I just thought I'd save myself free writing all the slides. So we've got the pressure gradient terms, we've got the Coriolis force terms, then we've got the kind of time derivative terms on the, on the far left. And when you're going down to the conservation of mass, you can just see that the, it's the convergence and divergence of the horizontal flow basically creates perturbations in, in the height of the, of the surface that you're representing. So you're talking about convergence and divergence of the flow within this layer causes the height of the layer to change. Okay, so what, what we've got, you know, you're saying, well, how can you represent the whole atmosphere, you know, with this kind of, you know, this set of equations? Because we don't really have any kind of vertical structure information. And so what goes along with each one of these, um, you know, each one of these sets of shallow water model equations is a vertical structure function. So these are the vertical structure functions for the ocean and these are the vertical structure functions for the atmosphere and it's just the first couple of modes. You can see that M equals zero vertical structure function. Um, and in this case, it's just all of the one sign, so that's the barotropic mode. It's just saying that the, you know, the velocity of the zonal velocity is just basically the same the whole way through the entire column. And then you've kind of got the M equals one mode. Uh, the M equals one is basically saying what's happening aloft is the opposite of what's happening at the surface. So you just basically, you know, you've got this two-layer representation of the ocean and the atmosphere. And then you've got, you know, the M equals three and the M equals four. And as you're going up in mode numbers, the, the vertical structure is getting more and more complex. So basically, if you have these shallow water model equations, you've then got this, you've also got this kind of um, vertical structure function. You can then reconstruct the variability um, throughout the atmosphere that would go along with this kind of first baroclinic mode. Um, so in, in this case, yeah, so I think I've said all of that kind of stuff. What, what it turns out is the first baroclinic mode represents, you know, at least from my perspective, a lot of the things that are kind of quite important um, in the ocean and in the atmosphere. So there was a model by Richard Kleeman um, who worked at the Bureau of Meteorology up until probably the early 2000s. He developed an atmospheric model that was part of the actual ENSO forecast model and it operated, uh, it was operational at the Bureau of Meteorology until the mid 2000s. So it was their, one of their main kind of forecast models. And it was just a lin linear shallow water model atmosphere, a linear shallow water model ocean. The atmosphere was just this um, first baroclinic mode. And what they did, they made the assumption, well, they only really um, modelled the flow in the lower layer and said the flow in the upper layer is going to be the exact opposite of what's happening in the lower layer. Okay? And that was all, all that was really needed. So you only needed to solve that one kind of set of equations and the vertical structure function was simple enough that you just kind of did that multiplied by minus one. And that's exactly what's shown here. So you've got cyclones at the surface in the 
hectopascal level are related to anticyclones at the 250 hectopas hectopascal level. Um, and, and it's the, you know, the same for the anticyclones and the cyclones. Okay. All right, um, so the, the next kind of simplification we're going to do is just simplify the Coriolis parameter, just take the beta plane approximation. So what we do here is the Coriolis parameter, you know, obviously varies with latitude and it follows this kind of black line. And what we're doing is we're going to take this red dashed line instead. And you can see when you're considering the tropics between plus and minus 30 degrees, there's no, there's no real difference between the two. It's kind of saying it's a good approximation and this kind of simplifies the solutions that we can come up with. So it's a... You know, it's a, it's a relatively, relatively accurate assumption that we can take at this point to simplify things. All right. So these are the equations now. We've just got the replace, uh, the Coriolis force replaced with this beta x and beta y. Oh, sorry, the beta y term. So the beta is just the, sorry, I should have pointed out, it's just a single value, a number, and the y is the distance from the equator. So all that really matters is our distance from the equator. And now what we're going to do is non-dimensionalize these equations just to make them simpler. So we're going to remove all of the kind of G primes and capital H's and wave speeds. Um, so we're kind of, this is something, there's, there's, I should say, there's kind of a lot of maths. And if you went through everything, it would probably take a few hours to kind of get through. So I'm skipping through a lot. A lot of the detail is provided in the slides. Okay, what I'm non-dimensionalizing about and a lot of the detail, but I won't be able to go through it in detail in 50 minutes. Um, so we're kind of going to skip through it. So this is what I've non-dimensionalized about, and this is what the non-dimensionalized equations kind of turn out to be. Okay. So now the first thing we're going to move on to, so I've introduced the model that we've kind of been dealing with, and the first thing we're going to move on to is the equatorial Kelvin wave. Okay, for the equatorial Kelvin wave, the first thing we're looking for, we're looking for zonal wave propagation. Okay, and the thing that we want to find is what happens if V is equal to zero. So if, if we're making the assumption that there's no meridional flow, Okay, so that's our first assumption, V is equal to zero. Then the shallow water model equations are reduced to these set of equations here. Okay, you can see there's kind of no V terms in there because anything that turns to what had V in it turns to zero. We then look for these solutions. So you can see um, we've kind of got the U is equal to this U hat term. So the U hat is kind of giving us this meridional structure that's going to go along with it. And then you've got this E to the IKX minus sigma T. And this is giving us um, the zonal direction um, of the wave function and kind of all the, the time variability of the wave function. So basically the, the wave motion is going to be made up of this E term and the meridional kind of structure of the wave is made up by the U hat and the E to hat terms. So basically what we do is we just plug these solutions into those equations and then you can actually solve. You can calculate the X derivatives and time derivatives. Okay, so you can calculate the X derivatives and time derivatives and then you come up with these equations here. Okay, and now if you get this first equation for u, so it puts u in terms of eta, and you can put um, the, replace this u with the, the eta component of that, and then you can kind of solve this and show that it says that sigma is equal to k. I should have pointed out, sigma is the frequency, and k is the wave number. Okay, so the, it's the, the frequency, how many oscillations you're having in some given period of time is the sigma term, and the k term is, you know, how long is the wave. So... Um, so what's the wave number? A wave number one kind of means there's one wavelength will take you the whole way around the globe. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to have a quick drink. Yes? A wave number one, it will, it'll be one wavelength will take you the whole way around the globe. Okay, so it's a very long wavelength. Okay. Um, so what we've got here, we've got the sigma is equal to plus or minus k. And we need to work out whether it is a plus or a minus, and, and does it actually matter? The next thing we've got, we can put that, the first equation, insert the first equation into the second equation, and you can kind of come up with this, that the y derivative of eta is equal to minus y multiplied by eta itself. Okay, we know these two things are kind of equal to each other. Okay, there, there might be a change of sign. So we've kind of got this, you know, the y derivative of eta, so the, the pressure perturbation is equal to plus or minus um, y multiplied by eta. Okay, so this gives us information about the meridional structure of the wave, okay? So we know that the, we don't know what the, we don't know what the meridional structure is, but we know the derivative of the meridional structure is the, is the structure itself. Okay, and that gives us an indication that it's actually going to be an exponential function, because the derivative of an exponential function is an exponential function. Okay, 
So there, there it is there. So you can kind of say, well, we know it's going to have this kind of term here. And we know we, we kind of, it has the option of being a plus or a minus exponential function. And if you think about a positive exponential function, if that's, it's, it's actually going to be increasing with velocity further and further as we move away from the equator. Okay, and it just gets really big. Whereas if it's a minus, it's got its maximum on the equator. Okay, and it decays away from the equator. So a negative is the more logical um, solution choice. So you can kind of say, well, this is the, the meridional structure of our Kelvin wave, and we've got this um, e to zero term here, which is going to give the amplitude of that kind of wave function. Okay, um, and then because we've kind of said, well, now this is now, we know this structure, and we know, uh, what did that say? So we know that means that the sigma over k had to be a positive, okay, which means that sigma actually has to be equal to k, okay, in this case. Um, and that means so we've got this thing kind of decaying away from the equator, like we said. And, and when you can put all this back into the equation three, you can find out that the meridional structure of u has to be the same as the meridional structure of eta. Okay, so it's kind of telling us that all these things, the u and the eta have the same structure. We know um, v is equal to zero, and we know sigma is equal to k. So it's kind of saying that the wavelength is equal to the, sorry, the frequency is equal to the wave number. Okay, so what does all that mean? So what does it mean when this frequency is equal to the wave number? Okay, it means basically that the waves are non-dispersive. So the energy of a packet of waves propagates the same direction as the wave itself. So you can kind of see here, this is the wave number on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. And you can see the Kelvin wave is this kind of line that just goes up to the, um, at a straight angle to up to the right. So you've kind of, every, er, at every point in time, you can see it's eastward propagating the, this, um, the group velocity is equal to this. The group velocity is always equal to 1, so it's always an eastward kind of group velocity, which means the wave is non-dispersive. Okay. I'm sorry. If I kind of, I've got a lot to go through, so I need you to stop me. If you ask me any questions, if you think I've skipped over something, if you want me to slow down. Um, okay. So we kind of come, we'll come back to it at the end and we'll kind of give a summary of you know, everything we know about a Kelvin wave and kind of what we can understand from it. So if we're looking at the solution, so we talked about that kind of exponential decay away. So this is the solution. Um, so you've kind of, this is the solution here and this is the solution when it's dimensionalized. And what you can see the red line here is the meridional structure of an atmospheric Kelvin wave. Okay, you can see its maximum amplitude is on the equator and it decays away from the equator. And you can see, you know, this thing's kind of extending, you know, out to plus or minus kind of 30 degrees, in, encasing kind of the whole tropical, the whole, the whole tropics. And if you're looking at the ocean, um, the oceanic Kelvin wave is kind of, you know, much more confined to the equator, so it's kind of spanning five north, five south. Okay, and you can see, I suppose the main difference between the atmosphere and the ocean Kelvin wave is the speed that the waves are propagating. Forgive my spelling. <laughs> There's a typo in there. Um, so you can see when you look at the dimensionalized form of the equations, you multiply by 2c. And I don't know if I've said it, so c is, the, is the, the gravity wave speed. So c for the ocean is around 3 meters per second, and c for the atmosphere is around 50 meters per second. So that, that difference in the denominator here um, kind of leads to this kind of large change in, in kind of the, the meridional width of kind of the, the equatorial Kelvin wave. Yeah. Okay, so atmospheric um, gravity wave speed should be, it's some, somewhere between 30 and kind of 70 meters per second, and it really depends on, on, on um, what you choose as your, the height. Um, you have to choose this kind of reference height, and I think it's kind of quite, quite a subjective um, kind of measure. All right. All right, um, so we're kind of going to, you know, confirming our choice for u is equal to eta, we can kind of do this simple thing. So the second equation um, of the v is equal to zero shallow water model equation states that y multiplied by u is equal to the pressure gradient in the y derivative. So this is kind of saying Coriolis force is equal to the pressure gradient force. So it's saying there's this kind of geostrophic balance um, in that. And if you consider, you know, you've got u, uh, sorry, your, your pressure perturbation here in the red, and if you're considering a flow out of the page, which is again saying that u is equal to eta, okay, we then have this, um, 
we, send out, we then have you know, the pressure gradient force balancing the Coriolis force when you're doing it that way. And if you're kind of saying, well, what if, what if u was equal to minus eta, okay, and you've got this opposite, well, it doesn't actually work. So you end up with the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force going the same way, which means the wave would just kind of flatten out and, and there'd be no kind of propagation. Okay. All right. So now what we've got up here is basically a, a general solution for an equatorial Kelvin wave. You're just saying U is equal to eta, so the, the zonal flow is equal to the pressure perturbation when it's non-dimensionalized. And the, the function of the wave is just this arbitrary G. So it can be anything. You could say it's a sine wave or a cos wave or something simple like that. And then the X is the, the zonal kind of location. You're mo minusing um, C, which is the gravity wave speed, multiplied by the time. And then you've got this e to the minus y squared over 2, which is giving this marional structure. So that's the, the generalized equation for an equatorial Kelvin wave. And if you're kind of considering um, this wave, which is here in the black line, so the black line is the, is the you know, you can consider it the zonal, um, so it's the thermocline depth or the surface pressure or whatever, or pressure perturbation. And you can see we've kind of got, wherever we've got a positive pressure perturbation, we've got flow going the same direction. We've got a positive flow. Um, and it kind of leads to this convergence at the leading edge of that wave disturbance. And it's that convergence which causes the wave to propagate in the eastward direction. And you can kind of see there's this divergence at the trailing edge of, of the positive pressure perturbation, which kind of leads to this um, propagation of the negative kind of pressure perturbation. So basically all of these things combine to give you this kind of, you know, this dashed line and it's kind of how the wave kind of propagates forward. Um, so wave propagation speed of 50 meters per second for a dry Kelvin wave, you'll basically cover this distance, so that's 200 degrees longitude um, in around five days, okay? And it'll make it the whole way around the globe in around nine days, okay? So you can put up, you know, uh, you know, a change, you know, force some kind of wave in the Pacific Ocean, okay, and it's gone the whole way around the globe in, in under two weeks. Okay, um, so I did mention actually on, on this previous slide, I kind of said a dry Kelvin wave, okay. There, there is also something called a um, convectively coupled um, Kelvin wave, and what happens here, so um, this is kind of an idealized schematic of a Kelvin wave at the 200 hectopascal surface. So you can remember this is the opposite of what's happening at the, at the surface itself. So you can kind of see there's this divergence flow um, at the 200 hectopascal surface, which means there's convergent flow at the surface. And you, where, the, where the flow is converging, you have this convection in the center of this wave. Okay, so you can think of this convection as something that's actually forcing a wave structure itself. So it's generating a perturbation by itself. So the Kelvin waves force this convection, but the convection itself is also forcing this kind of wave response. And what that acts to do is acts to slow down the wave propagation. So in the observations, you can again see um, the red contours are the high pressure at the 200 hectopascal, and the blue contours are the, the low pressure at the 200 hectopascal. So you can see, and the green is kind of the rainfall, which is roughly equivalent to surface wind convergence. And you can see there's this kind of blue arrow kind of down here showing how this wave kind of propagates. And when you've got a convectively coupled um, Kelvin wave, these waves are typically propagating around 12 to 25 metres per second. So much slower than the roughly you know, 50 metres per second you're getting for, for a free or a dry um, Kelvin wave. Okay, and it kind of says that it's got a typical period of six to seven days. And what that means is if I'm kind of standing um, at this point, I, don't know, I can't see anywhere on a map here. Oh, yeah. So if I'm kind of standing um, on this point on the African west coast, okay, as is, so I'm standing here and it'll take six to seven days for me for this, the end of this kind of negative pressure perturbation to kind of cross over my head. Okay, so what do we know? What have we learned about the equatorial Kelvin wave? All right. Okay, um, so you've got, it relies on the change in sign of the Coriolis force at the equator and it makes the equator function much like, a, like an actual boundary. So Kelvin waves can also occur kind of on, along coastal, um, on, uh, in the ocean, along the coasts of the ocean, and also occurs along mountain ranges in the atmosphere. Um, so you've got no normal flow to the boundary at, at, the, so at the equator in our conditions, so V is equal to zero. They've got their maximum amplitude on the equator, 
and their, um, their amplitude kind of decays as you're moving away from the equator and it follows the equatorial radius of deformation. And flow along the, the boundary of the equator is in geostrophic balance with the pressure gradient force. So that's kind of basically explaining why the, the V is equal to zero. Okay. Um, and they've got a rough speed of two to three meters per second for the ocean and 50 meters per second for the atmosphere. In the ocean, this effectively means that you can have a signal generated in the West Pacific and it will propagate to the East Pacific. So it allows the communication between the East and West of the basin, the West and Eastern of the basin. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, and in the atmosphere, you can get a signal to propagate the entire way around the globe in you know, just over a week. So basically any kind of perturbation um, can create this uni uniform change in, in the atmospheric circulation. And the waves are non-dispersive, so once they're generated, they, they generally, um, they, they only will decay due to friction. Okay. All right. So now we're gonna, is, is there any questions actually on the Kelvin wave? Yes. 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 Meridional flow. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so now we're going to go for you know looking at other equatorially trapped waves. You can also actually come up with the solution with the solution for the equatorial Kelvin wave looking at this way, but I kind of it's more logical for me at least to do it the other way with the v is equal to zero. Um, so in this case, we're starting with the same equations. Um, you can see I've conveniently changed to do the atmosphere now. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of looking at you know, changes in, in geopotential height. Um, you can see the only real difference is the G prime is dropped out from here. And instead of having a capital H down here, we've got a G prime H. That should just be a G, actually. Um, but but they're, they're virtually, virtually the same. So in this case, we're going to look for zonally propagating solutions of, of the same form as what we did for the Kelvin wave. The, the difference here is we're not setting our V is equal to zero. So we've just got a, you know, a, a more complete kind of set to start with. All right. Okay. So th th this is the solution. So I said the first thing you can do when you plug these solutions into the shallow water model equations is you can, look, you can actually calculate the derivatives in X and T. So these are the solutions when you calculated the derivatives in X and T. Again, the omega term is kind of giving you the frequency of any wave solutions, and the K term is giving you the wave number of any wave solutions. Okay, so you've kind of got all the, you know, the omega is something, um, and K is something that I suppose we can solve for or choose. Um, and then we've kind of, which we will once we find out the dispersion relation. So basically what we want to do is we want to try and make this one equation. One equation and one unknown. Okay, and then we can solve it analytically. Okay, so the first step to doing this, I, I should, this is probably four pages of maths if you're going through it, working it out, and I'll put it in one slide. So if you don't follow it, I'll understand. Okay, so the first one we're just rearranging, we just want to get it in terms of u. The same as what we did for the Kelvin wave, and then we can say u is equal to a function of the geopotential height um, and the meridional velocity. Okay, and then we plug that back into this equation two. Okay, and we can get an equation for v that's a function of geopotential height only. Okay, and now we can plug that same thing into the equation three. Okay, and we get an equation uh, for geopotential height that is a function of u only, I mean, a function of v only. Okay, so now we've got this thing is a function of geopotential height, and geopotential height is a function of v. So what we can do is we can insert 3.1 into, back into 2.1, okay, and then we've got this equation that's all in terms of v, okay. So it's one equation um, and one unknown. So we've kind of got this second order differential equation here, um, so you can just see the, the second derivative of a v here and the v here, and then these are all just kind of terms. Um, you know, I suppose that the, the c's is uh, the wave speed, which is kind of a given. Um, we've got the, the frequency and, and the wave number, which is kind of somewhat, some, at least a partial, a partial choice of ours. Okay. And the interesting thing about this kind of boxed up bit in the centre here, um, so I don't know, some geniuses. <laughs> Uh, kind of figured out this is just a, a well-known equation in physics called the Schrodinger equation. Okay, if you make the assumption, okay, that um, v has to equal zero, 
as the distance from the equator gets very large, okay, this is, this is exactly the same as the Schrodinger equation in physics. Okay, and that's shown to have these solutions of this form. So the solutions for this equation, so the V is equal to this Hn multiplied by this exponentially decaying um, component as you're moving away from the equator. So you can you look at this, this is, this is our Kelvin wave, our dimensionalized kind of Kelvin wave um, structure in the meridional direction, and Hn is something called a Hermite polynomial. Okay. Um, if you're looking, so what you can do, you can look at, you know, so these are the different Hermite polynomials, okay, here, okay, just for the first four, so that you can have an infinite number of these things, and these are the Hermite functions, so this is the, the total kind of V solution for the zero order, first, second, and third. So you can see the zeroth order, this bit here, just is equal to one, okay, so we've just got this thing that's decaying away from the equator, much like the equatorial Kelvin wave, okay, and then you can see so each of these things are kind of, a, each of these solutions is orthogonal to each other. And what that means when they're orthogonal to each other, you can basically, if you've got an infinite number of these things and they're all kind of independent of each other, you can choose any, any meridional structure you would like and you can make it up with the sum of these Hermite functions, okay? So you can have this, you know, very kind of complex structure and you know that you're just going to need, uh, you, can, you can make it up into these kind of simple structures. And I, I suppose the, the important aspect of this is each of these things kind of have their own kind of propagation speed and their own characteristics and it makes it so you can kind of decompose a, an atmospheric response into something more simple and understand it at this kind of fundamental level is what is the exact solution um, for, this, for this problem. Okay. So this was that, that kind of bracketed bit, okay? Uh, and in this form, this has that kind of, it has uh, an inbuilt decay as you're moving away from the equator when it's equal to this 2n plus 1. So the n is something we can choose, and it's the n is the mode number. So it's the, you know, when we're talking about uh, this n, so the, the order of the Hermite polynomial. So it's, you know, what order mode are we, are we um, looking for? And it basically allows two main kinds of solutions. So when we've got this, um, the frequency of the wave is getting um, very low, so we're looking for low frequency solutions, we end up with these, this geostrophic, um, geostrophic flow and we end up with kind of Kelvin and Rosby waves. And then we've got, when we've got the, I should have removed Kelvin wave because I'm not going to go into it here. And when we've got this um, W, the frequency is very large, we've kind of got these inertia gravity waves. Okay, and there's also an n equals zero mixed, gra mixed Rossby gravity wave that we'll kind of discuss as well. Okay, so for the mixed Rossby gravity wave, so we've got that same equation that I started with on the, on the other page, so that's the dispersion relation. And basically setting n is equal to zero, okay, you can then show that w is equal to this. So what that means is we've got a w that we can um, choose, oh, so we've got a k, that we choose, okay, and then we can calculate W. We've got an N, which we've chosen to equal zero, okay, so we've got this, we know our V, we know our second derivative of V, we know um, our W, because we can calculate it from our K, we know our C, so it basically means we know everything. And then we know everything, we can insert it back into the equations that we started with, okay, and find, find out the structure of these equations, okay. So the, the contour lines in, in this plot are the pressure perturbations, so the changes in geopotential height. Okay, um, the shaded areas are areas of con, uh, divergence and the, uh, what would you call that? Whatever those areas are, I'm having a mental blank, are areas of convergence. And you can kind of see the flow. So you can see, so for an n equals zero, um, K is equal to minus one, we get this mixed Rosby gravity wave. Okay, you can kind of see there's no zonal flow on the equator, you've got this flow kind of across the equator. And you can imagine as this thing is kind of propagating, and you can see there's kind of convergence here and convergence there, you're going to have these alternating blobs kind of popping up on either side of the equator that are kind of disappearing and reappearing as this kind of wave is propagating. Okay, uh, and for an eastward inertia gravity wave, so these things are, you know, for when we choose our K is equal to one, you can kind of again see the, the pressure perturbations um, as the, the, the contour lines and the divergence and convergence um, again. Uh, so di divergence is the shading. Um, yeah. And again, we've kind of got no zonal flow on the equator. We've got this kind of cross equatorial flow and these kind of pressure perturbations off the equator. All right, so if you have a look at the dispersion relation for this, so for this mixed Rosby gravity wave, when we kind of got this K is equal to minus one, you can kind of see we've got this, you know, we get this westward propagation, but 
the phase velocity of these things is eastward. So what it means is these things are dispersive waves. You've kind of got the waves is propagating westward, but the energy of their wave is propagating eastward. And when we go over to the right-hand side of the mixed Rossby gravity wave, so we've got the inertia gravity waves. What was it called? Yeah. Um, basically, it's like a, like a Kelvin wave. Um, so it's, it's non-dispersive. There's eastward energy and eastward wave propagation. Yeah. Um, they're not my the waves I'm most interested in, so I don't, you know, that's about, that's about all I know about them. And I don't, I don't have any observational pictures of them to show you what, what they would look like in the observations. And what I found what people had named as an observation, I was pretty certain it was just a Rosby wave, so I'll, I'll kind of keep it at that. All right, so now we can look for inertia gravity waves. Um, and in this case, what, what we're doing is we can simplify kind of this dispersion relation and just say, uh, when W is high, when we have this high frequency W, this term becomes very small. Okay, so we can just neglect this term in the box, and then we can have this equation here again for our W in terms of our K. Okay, and again, so we know everything that we need. We know our structure of, you know, we can select our structure of V. Um, we can select uh, select our given K. We can calculate our W, and then we can kind of work out the kind of pressure perturbations and, and see the structure of the waves that we're. Um, that would accompany this. All right. Uh, okay. So again, you can kind of see this. I don't know this kind of circular flow. There's those, again no 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 zonal flow on the equator. You can kind of see this flow kind of going around in circles around the equator. Okay. Um, you can see the the meridional structure. I should have actually pointed out. So when we were when we went to the um, the n equals zero. We had the n equals zero. You can see the meridional structure of, of the flow is that of a Kelvin wave. So we had the n equals. So I should point out that we had the. The n equals zero is this kind of black, you know, where you got the maximum amplitude on the equator, so much like the equatorial Kelvin wave. Um, you can kind of see that the same thing in the in the meridional structure of of the, yeah, of the meridional flow. Okay, so getting back to my point. Sorry for jumping around. Okay, so again, you know, we've kind of got this um, asymmetric uh, pattern. Uh, this pattern is kind of asymmetric about the equator. We've got this kind of cross equatorial flow. There's no zonal flow on the equator, um, and we kind of, you know, this is the k is equal to minus one, and here we've chosen the n equals two. I suppose one, one thing. So n equals minus two. Um, you can see when we're kind of looking at, um, you know, we've looked at n equals two. I think we've looked at n equals one. And n equals zero, and the things that you kind of you will become apparent if it hasn't already that the even when your n is an even number, okay, the patterns you're going to get are going to be the pressure patterns you're going to get are asymmetric about the equator, and when the n equals um, is equal to an odd number, you're going to get these symmetric patterns about the equator, okay. Yeah. So the, you know these are inertial gravity waves. So these are things that are occurring on the, on the time scale of kind of days and less than less than days. Okay, you know, the, the periods we're talking about. All right, again, so now we've kind of got the n equals one um, terms, and you can see we're now symmetric about the equator. Okay, and you can again see this kind of circular flow against the equator, but in this case we have this kind of zonal flow on the equator as well that's accompanying this kind of circular motion of the equator. Okay. All right, so the dispersion relation for this, so we've kind of got Westward and eastward propagating kind of inertia gravity waves. Um, the eastward propagating waves have also have this eastward kind of energy propagation, so they're considered non-dispersive. Um, and the west, most of the westward propagating waves have westward energy propagation. But you can kind of see for these ones um, of kind of low wave number in here, you can kind of see these positive slopes, although the waves are propagating westward. So these ones that are close in here are, are dispersive. So the mix. Uh, yeah, no, I was going to say something different then. So yeah, these ones here are, di are actually dispersive waves. So the energy is propagating this in a different direction to the actual waves propagating. All right, and now we're going to move on to equatorial Rosby waves. So this is what you get. So this, this term on the left-hand side becomes um, very small at low frequencies. Okay, um, and then that simplifies. So you can have this, you know, this omega term. So this frequency term um, can be a function of k, and this is the thing. And then we can, you know, generate again our, our different kind of wave propagations. Okay, so again, we've kind of gotten an n equals two and an n equals three kind of Rosby wave. Um, 
Yeah, I suppose I'm going to jump to the next slide. I suppose it's most important we'll talk about the N equals 1 Rossby wave. This is the one when you've got, you know, where you've got some kind of heating force on the equator. The most prominent thing that you're going to generate is an N equals 1 Rossby wave. Okay, so it's just this kind of pair of low pressure cells or a pair of high pressure cells that are straddling the equator. They've got um, kind of, yeah, so for a low pressure cell, they've kind of got this divergence at the western edge, which is in kind of leading to the propagation of the wave. And you can kind of see this kind of flow around the kind of geostrophic flow kind of around um, the low pressure cell. The N equals 1 wave um, generally has a propagation speed which is around, so these, these speeds are wrong, and these are my ocean propagation speeds. But you can see um, it's the gravity wave speed, so in the atmosphere that's 50 meters per second divided by 2n plus 1. And in here, so the n is equal to 1, so it's just 50 meters per second divided by 3. So you're talking kind of, I don't know, 15 or 16.6 meters per second for the n equals 1 gravity wave. And then you've got the n equals 2 and the n equals 3. You can see as the n's increasing, the waves themselves are propagating slower. Now, sorry. If we kind of go back to the n equals 2, you can kind of see the pressure, but pressure perturbations um, for the n equals 2 are asymmetric about the equator because it's an even order okay, um, function. Okay, so it's, they're asymmetric about the equator. And then you go to the n equals 3, you can see it's kind of, it's symmetric about the equator. <laughs> It's got low pressure cells, it's still got geostrophic flow around the cells, and you can see the low pressure cells are just um, more poleward displaced. So as the, order, as the order of the Rossby wave is getting higher, the displacement away from the equator is getting larger. Now I'm not sure, I, I should have kind of you know, put in a plot to show this. As you see kind of Rossby waves propagating away from some given source, if you're looking for them in the observations, you'll generally see that the ones that are closest to the equator are kind of propagating faster, and then there's kind of this stretching as they're kind of going away from the equator where the signal is propagating fastest at the equator and that's basically showing what we're seeing here that the n equals 3 Rossby wave propagates much slower than the n equals 1 Rossby wave so you can kind of get generate you know if you know the exact components of what's actually um, what's the makeup of the force signal you can see that it's, it's due to this combination of the, you know, the higher order Rossby waves that kind of gives this stretching shape that we know about has anyone seen the stretching shape that I'm talking about? No? Sorry, I'm a bad lecturer. I should have brought a picture of that. And from the ocean, it's, it's something that's really apparent from the ocean. You know, when a, when a, uh, a Rossby wave peels away from the eastern boundary of, of the Pacific Ocean, okay, the waves basically, they propagate really fast near the equator. So this is the equator here. They propagate really fast near the equator and much slower as you're moving polewards. And they've kind of got this, um, you know, a chevron shape around the equator of the wave propagation. And it's due to these kind of different propagation speeds of these higher order modes. Um, and you're getting slower as you're moving more and more poleward that, that generates this kind of, um, this chevron shape. All right. Okay, so when we're looking at kind of the mixed Rossby gravity, sorry, the Rossby, sorry, the Rossby waves in here, you can kind of see when we're, when we're talking um, for, for, you know, uh, very, very low wave numbers, so very long wavelengths. So you can see um, we've kind of got this westward propagation and we also have the westward sloping lines, which means the energy is also propagating westward. So they're largely non-dispersive for this kind of short range that's in here. But as you're getting um, to these kind of shorter wavelengths um, and higher wave numbers, you can see that the slopes of the lines generally starts to go the other way. So you've kind of got this eastward energy propagation and westward wave propagation. So for higher frequency Rossby waves, or you know, higher wave number of Rossby waves, you've kind of got this, um, that they are dispersive. All right. All right, so what do we know about equatorially trapped waves? So they're basically how the tropical ocean and atmosphere adjust when they're perturbed, you know. Um, you know, if you, if you think about the atmosphere, you can generally think of convection as the perturbation, and if you're thinking about the ocean, you think about the wind stress forcing is gonna be the perturbation. Um, waves of an odd, even order are symmetric and an odd order, no, even order are asymmetric and an odd order are symmetric about the equator. Um, for long periods, generally inertia gravity waves are not produced and it leaves Kelvin and Rossby waves um, and, and sometimes mixed Rossby gravity waves to do the adjustment. And Kelvin and short wavelength Rossby waves are the only low frequency waves that prop carry energy eastward, but Rossby waves only propagate westward. Okay, so what that means is the Rossby waves are dispersive for short wavelengths. Um, and Kel Kel generally Kelvin waves travel roughly three times faster than the N equals one um, trapped Rossby wave does. Yeah, I think that kind of summarizes everything that I know.
All right. So now we're going to move on for the last kind of 10 minutes and look at the steady state solution. So these are um, Gill and Matsuno, I think. So Gill did it in 1980 and Matsuno did it in 1969, but they both kind of did it you know, differently and I think Gill extended on the work of Matsuno. So you can see we've started off with the exact same equations. Um, the only difference we've got in this time, instead of uh, the conservation of mass kind of equation equal to zero, we're saying it's equal to minus Q and this minus Q is some heating rate. Okay. Now that does, that does two things. It kind of means we're not actually conserving mass. You can think about we're not actually conserving mass in this kind of lower layer. If you think about this two layer system, you can think when you're adding this heat source here, you're basically allowing mass to be exchanged between the lower layer and the upper layer of the models. Okay, is a, is a way to view adding this kind of heat source perturbation. Um, and what it means is the vertical velocity, um, I, I've called it the vertical velocity of the geopotential surface is equal to this. Um, yeah. So generally, you know, you could, if that's correct, if this term isn't there, but when that term's there, there's kind of a little bit of vertical velocity of the pressure surface, and then there's also a little bit of an exchange between the two, the two atmospheric layers. Okay. All right, so what, when we're looking for steady state solutions, I should have said, um, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to introduce Rayleigh friction and Newtonian cooling. So we're going to have friction on the momentum equations, and we're going to have this Newtonian cooling on kind of the height perturbations, the pressure perturbations. Um, so we're saying this is kind of a heat source, and then we're going to damp it out. And basically what you can say, um, and then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to drop the time derivative, because we're not interested in time-varying solutions. We just want to know the steady state. So what that means we can do, we can drop the time derivative and we can just replace it by this, uh, I don't even know what that term's called, I don't know, this, this funny E. <laughs> um, so you kind of just got this kind of damping term and what we've said is the Newtonian cooling and the Rayleigh damping are the same, okay? So it's just the same number for both of it. So we're at the same level of damping, okay? So this is, this is the solutions, we've got this heating rate, we've got this damping rate and then we've kind of got the, you know, the total solution for the thing. Now, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gill solutions, basically they chose this kind of heat source that had a structure like this, and they chose it like that because it was easy to get analytical solutions um, for that. And this is the, the solution. So the, the solid line here is contours of pressure. Okay, and you can kind of see this Kelvin wave component of the solution kind of propagating eastward. Okay, um, and then there's kind of two Rossby wave components and they're kind of extending westward like that. You know, there is some kind of westward propagation, but this is a steady state. And so there's kind of, I suppose, no, this is uh, after the propagation. So you've got this consistently, this fixed heat source kind of occurring in, in the tropical Pacific and these are the waves that are radiating away from that heat source and they're just getting to this point where they're damped, okay, not going anywhere. And this is largely what you can think of the atmosphere doing during an El Nino event. You know, we kind of have this heat source, on, additional heat source or shifting of this heat source on the equator during an El Nino event, which is more in the, the central equatorial Pacific. And this is the, the typical atmospheric response. So you're going to have these westerly winds um, related to the kind of the, the Rossby wave pair straddling the equator to the west of this kind of heat source. And to the east of this heat source, you've kind of got this um, weaker kind of easterly winds due to the Kelvin wave. Okay, and it's these westerly winds which are thought to be one of the main components for the atmospheric feedback for an El Nino event. So you kind of have this change in, um, change in convection in the central Pacific and then the wind perturbation that goes along with that change in convection then reinforces um, the ocean perturbation driving more convection and then the westerlies that go along with that again you know, drive the ocean even more, kind of creating more SST anomalies. So it's kind of, it, was a, it was a very important solution and when I talked about Richard Kleeman's model earlier, it was basically doing exactly this. So they just get the one month sea surface temperature anomalies and they'd say, well, the atmosphere is basically going to um, respond instantaneously to these changes. So they kind of calculated the gill solutions, okay, and then they were the winds that you would then force an ocean model, model with for the next month. And then the, the ocean model would run out for a month. You'd see the waves propagating away and then after a month they'd kind of come back to the atmosphere Okay, and say, so this is the new sea surface temperature map we're going to give you, you know, what are the winds going to do? And that, so this was an operational forecast model up until, you know, the mid-2000s. I think it was 2005 or 2006 was the last time this model was used operationally. So although it's kind of very simple, it's, it's very useful and, and it kind of gives you a good understanding of the underlying kind of dynamics. Um, so these are also kind of the, the changes, sorry, in, in the zonal mean circulation that go along with these kind of uh, pressure perturbations. So you can talk about, you know, there's been talk about, you know, these um, changes in the Walker circulation when you have an El Nino event. And this is basically the changes in the Walker circulation. 
So um, there was a, a paper in Nature Climate Change recently, and they're kind of talking about you know what happens when you have a you know a large heat source in in the Atlantic Ocean. You know, and I've talked about these waves being able to propagate around the globe, uh, around the globe in in kind of you know nine days. This is in the GFDL model, okay, where they've applied this heat source in the tropical Atlantic. So this is day three, day five, day seven, and you can see you generating winds. In the entire way around the, trop the tropics. Okay, so you've got this heat source in, in the tropical Atlantic and you're generating winds um, in, in the tropical Pacific. Okay, so it just kind of shows the large scales of these waves, shows how interconnected the basins, each of the basins can be. Okay, yeah. um, you know, I suppose when we're viewing INSA, you, you're viewing you know, these large changes here and we don't really, you know, you're not really focusing on the changes that are occurring in all the other basins due to the changes you're getting in INSO. But so this is kind of showing how you know interconnected the basins are, and I suppose it puts a bit more of a you know when you're looking at the Gill solutions with just the non-dimensionalized wave numbers, you've got to do these calculations in your head and kind of work out you know how far this thing's extending, uh, and this is just, I suppose just puts a picture in it. And I suppose that the power of the Gill solutions is you can get a, a solution like this. <laughs> Um, so you can get a, a solution like this just from a, from a general circulation model and you can kind of go, oh yeah, well, you know, there's Rosby waves here and there's a Kelvin wave there and then people say, well, you know, how, how do you actually know that? And you don't actually know that. You know, these things, if you've got a fixed heat source, they're not actually propagating away. It's just this kind of constant thing. So you can look at maybe the slope of the initial propagation of the wave and, and say that's consistent with. But it's not until you kind of go back to and you actually do these kind of solutions analytically that you can define what are the waves you've actually generated. All right, um, and so we've talked about, you know, I've talked about the relationship between ENSO um, and these things, and this is an, another way. So these, these bursts of wind um, on the equator are quite often related to a, a tropical cyclone pair that are sitting either side of the equator. So I've said that, you know, quite often you can have this heat source in the equator that's related to El Nino events, but westerly wind events are things that are actually thought to initiate El Nino events, and they can be initiated by the same thing. So you've got this, you know, it can be a, a disturbance through tropical convection on the equator for some reason, maybe related, and it generates um, the, Rosby, the Rosby wave pair, and this thing itself actually triggers the, triggers the El Nino event rather than just being the fit one, you know, one of the components in the feedback. Uh, and this is just kind of showing instances of this occurring in the observation. So this is in 1997, right in the middle of a big El Nino event. <laughs> Um, but you can kind of see the, the Rosby wave pair kind of straggling the equator. You can kind of see the cloud formation and, and kind of the rotational flow. Yeah. <coughs> and I'll do one more kind of quick bit, which is the steady state Gill solution. So he kind of had this interesting two experiments. One that was forced with that um, symmetric heat forcing right on the equator, and he had one that was forced by asymmetric heat forcing. So there was a blob of heat forcing north of the equator and a blob of you know, uh, negative heat source south of the equator. And this is the sum of both of those kind of solutions and it generates a really interesting <coughs> response, this asymmetric response. And the reason I highlight it is because you can get this kind of strong off, off equatorial flow um, and, and it's kind of related to, to what actually happens. This is more what actually happens during an El Nino event. You know, generally not having the, the convection sitting right on the equator and symmetric about the equator. It's a little bit north of the equator in early during the event development and it's a little bit south of the equator after the event development. So it's more consistent with what, what you would actually view. And it's also consistent with the, the cross equatorial flow is also consistent with um, monsoonal systems. Okay, so if you're looking at kind of and you know, this kind of cross equatorial flow associated with the Indian monsoon. There's this kind of cross equatorial flow and kind of this rotational component around the northern hemisphere. All right, that's, that's me done. Thank you very much for listening.